From historic downtown Waco, deep in the heart of Texas, this is First Sunday Morning, a ministry of the First Baptist Church of Waco. A part of our community, celebrating fellowship together and sharing ministry with others through the timeless good news of the gospel story of new life in Christ Jesus. like the kids to join me for the children's message. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good. You doing well? All right, very good. Hey, I brought a few things with me today. You know what this is? It's a hammer. All right, we passed the first one. Proud of you. All right, this one is a what? A screwdriver? This is a sheetrock saw. You use this to, to when you're trying to, trying to put the right where you have the power plugs and stuff like that. So I've used all of these things to hang sheet. Ryan was talking about hanging sheetrock last week on spring break down in Refurio. You know, when you have a crew of people working together, uh, they do different things and they use different tools. We had some guys that were tall enough they could just stand and, and, and push the seat rock against the ceiling so the guys could come back in with, with the drills. And that, they were very popular guys on the construction site. But everybody had a different job and they used different tools, but they worked together for one thing, for one purpose, and that was to get the work accomplished. They're coming to see us. <laughs> no, just, just kidding. Uh, so as Christian people, we all are called to work together for the purpose of God, and we're also given different tools and different abilities to do that. Today we're going to talk about the Christian practice of service. I want you to pay attention because there's a lot for you to learn, okay? Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for these children. I thank you for a chance that we have to worship alongside them. 
And I thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to be an example and a guide for them. Help us, Lord, as we serve to give them an image of what it's like to be a follower of Jesus, serving alongside you. God, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You have a great morning, guys. Love y'all. Good morning. Would you join me with the responsive reading found in your worship guide, please? We're reading from the book of Psalms today. And if you will read the bold print, I will read the light print. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn away from your ordinances, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path.
Lord, we come to you today with our tithes and our offerings to you. We ask you that these gifts help to refresh our service from Waco to Refurio to Ecuador, Italy, and the UK. They go a long way, Lord, and we just ask that they help spread the gospel. So refresh our hearts as we give to you throughout the year. In Christ's name we pray, amen. we stand in this place, let's hear the word of the Lord together from Mark's gospel. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. He said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. 
Lord, we thank you for your word. We are grateful for a chance to sit under it for a moment together, Lord. We thank you that you guide our steps, that you direct our paths, that you shine a light for us. Lord, as we come to the scripture together today, we come asking you for eyes to see clearly, for ears to hear. Lord, we pray that you would make our hearts tender, that your word would be planted like a seed in rich, fertile soil. We pray, Lord, that you would give us feet that would walk quickly to do your will, that you'd strengthen our hands for service, that our work in this world would be like your very own. And Lord, we pray that a word of life and hope, a gospel word, would be found on our lips. Lord, this is our prayer in the strong name of Jesus, and we pray together saying, amen and amen. Please be seated. If you brought a Bible with you, I would invite you to turn to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. If you didn't bring one, there's one for you there in your pews. We'd like to invite you to use those this morning. This is our third sermon in a row on Mark 1, 35 to 39. Now, that's a little risky, but I've kept my job. We've had the same text for three weeks in a row uh, because we've been looking at some of the practices of Jesus. Uh, I, I shared at the very beginning that, that when I was in junior high, we wore those WWJD bracelets uh, and we failed miserably because we all attempted to do what Jesus would do without doing what Jesus did. Uh, and Jesus had a pattern of living. He had a pattern of life with the Lord. Uh, and we've been talking about some of those practices from these verses over the past few weeks. Uh, believing that these practices uh, create the kind of atmosphere in our own life where we can experience the refreshing presence of the Spirit of Christ in our lives. And that's what we all desperately need is a touch of God's grace uh, and his refreshing presence in our life. We have looked together at the practice of solitude, of getting away and being with God. It said Jesus went early in the morning before it was daylight. That sounds like the middle of the night to me, but that was the moment that Jesus got up and he packed up and he left his friends behind for a moment to be with God. We talked about the importance of solitude and how we all need it in our lives. We saw that, that those same friends that Jesus left found him. They got up and they went looking for him and they found him. And, and they said, hey, everybody's searching for you. And we saw Jesus respond and leave his place of solitude to re-enter into his relationships with those, with those friends and re-enter his relationship with the world. And we saw the interplay between the practice of solitude and solidarity, standing with people and for people. Jesus said, let us, let us. He lived his life in relationship with other people. And these two practices, they work together. They strengthen each other. They build on each other. They're like two wings on a dove or a butterfly or, or a hummingbird. Uh, they work together to propel us through the world as we follow Christ. You might remember the illustration of the, uh, of, of the button yo-yo and the super coiling. They super coil together to do something powerful and real. But friends, our life together doesn't end within that circle of familiarity. Our community doesn't end when we encourage one another. It doesn't end when we bear one another's burdens in the fulfillment of the law of Christ. It doesn't end when we strengthen each other to build one another up. We, too, in doing these things, must put our shoulders together and labor together in the world, fulfilling the purposes of God for our collective calling. Solitude and solidarity work together, and they work together to produce Christ-like service in the world. Jesus got up, and he went to a solitary place. He looked at his disciples and he said, let us. He entered into solidarity. And he said, let us go 
to these other towns, to these other places. For this is the purpose for which I came. Let us go and let us serve. And we have in these few verses a picture, if you will, of some of the elements, some of, some of the, the elements of a Christ-like service. What did Jesus do as he went into these synagogues? He went in proclaiming the message of the kingdom. So Christ-like service is, is an act of proclamation. It's a, it's a proclaiming act. And it also said that he went into these towns and he went into these cities and he cast out demons. That Jesus interacted with those deceiving, lying spirits, with those principalities and power set up against the wisdom and the knowledge of God. That Jesus went into these towns and he duked it out with the devil. Because all Christ-like service is going to be challenged. And Jesus challenged the challengers. And he brought peace where there was chaos. A Christ-like service not only proclaims but prevails. Do you remember that statement that Jesus made? On this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The lie and the death and the darkness will not prevail against the love and the power and the service of God's people. Today, I want to linger over these two descriptors, proclaiming and prevailing, because we are called to walk with Christ in this world that we live in. And our ministry must look somewhat like his. Our ministry, a ministry of proclaiming and a ministry of prevailing. Let's start with that first one, a ministry of proclaiming. We seem to understand that one a little bit better. I've sort of built a campsite in the book of 2 Corinthians recently. 2 Corinthians has been an epistle that's just been speaking to my own soul and nurturing my own heart. I would encourage you to read the whole of the epistle sometimes this week because I want to use a bunch of the text today. Uh, but 2 Corinthians is an example of someone, someone namely Paul, who decided that they were going to pattern their life after the pattern of Jesus. At one point along the way, Paul wrote to the church and he said, imitate me as what? As I imitate Jesus. Now, at first blush, that, that seems incredibly bold and confident. But what else do we have as leaders but an example and a desire to follow Christ? He said, I want to pattern my life. I want the goal of my life to be the imitation of Christ. And so he follows after that way. And what you have in 2 Corinthians are a number of examples of Paul and Titus and Timothy and the church seeking, endeavoring to live their life according to the rhythm and the pattern of the Spirit of Jesus. And you see a ministry blossom in Corinth that both proclaims the life of Christ and prevails against the forces of darkness. I want to highlight some of those ideas today. First, when he talked about proclaiming, he made it real clear what he was talking about. As the book of 2 Corinthians opens, he talks in chapter 2, verse 12, about the gospel of Christ. He wanted to make sure that we understood that his message was Christ, that Jesus and him crucified was what he proclaimed. When we get to the fourth chapter, verse 5, we get this fantastic verse of Scripture. And if I was to be pinned down and ask, what is a life verse for you, Matt? I would point to this one. This is the one that I go to again and again and again to reform my vision. Calls me back to, to what is core and vital about what I believe God has called me to. 
In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, Paul says, We don't proclaim ourselves. Plenty of people that do that. The world doesn't need another one. That one has a long fuse on it, you know. <laughs> Say, we don't proclaim ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. We proclaim the Lordship of Jesus Christ and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. He said, I've been called to serve the church for the sake of Jesus, to serve the body of Christ, that they would be equipped and they would be able to do the works of ministry and service. I have been called by God to serve the body of Christ, to help make the body of Christ stronger so that the church can serve in the world. He said, and I've been called to proclaim Christ Jesus as Lord. But notice, he never said I. He said we. Do you see how solidarity super coils with service too? Never at one point did he think he was by himself or alone because he knew that God had placed him within a community that was serving together. He said, I'm an apostle abnormally born. I came into this late and I came in by God's grace and God put me together with his people that we could work together together with him for the sake of his purposes in this earth. We, we, we. And when he writes the church in Corinth, he uses this we, this plural language, and you ask, who's he talking about? Well, specifically, he begins by talking about his relationship with Timothy. The whole letter comes from more than one person. He says, from Timothy, from me. And then later on, he introduces a guy named Titus. I think that's a great, strong name, Titus. He talks about Titus, and he says of Titus in chapter 2, uh, in chapter 8, he says, Titus was refreshed by your presence. He said, Titus came to you, and he learned what was going on in the church. And he says, and he was refreshed. That's the theme of the month, refreshing. And there is a refreshing that comes when brothers and sisters in Christ walk together. There is a refreshing that comes from that solidarity with God's people. He said, he was refreshed. And then he described Titus, and, and he said about Titus, he says, God has put a concern for you in his heart like he has put in mine. Wow, what a statement. It's almost a throwaway line, but it's so revealing about service together in the body of Christ. He said, church in Corinth, God has put a concern for you in the heart of Titus. As a pastor who's been involved in, in personnel issues and, and, and helping to call people into the ministry of the, of the life of this church, there's something that goes on and on and on. There's sort of four things you think about when you're asking questions about bringing people on to, to a ministry staff, to be part of a, a group of ministers that serve the church. Uh, one, you want to know if there's a sense of calling has God called them to this? There's a conviction in their heart that God has called them this. And has the church affirmed this? Uh, has, has the body of Christ whom this person worships with and serves alongside has affirmed? Yes, we see God's, God's hand on your life. We see this. We see God calling you to this service within the body of Christ to equip the saints for works of service. We see that. Is there a sense of calling is there a sense of competence? Are there, are there gifts there? Are there abilities? Are they being honed and sharpened? Are they being put to use? Uh, is, there, is there a basic sense of competency? Can they do what is asked of them? Can they do what God would have them do in that setting? Is there a conscientiousness? Do they work hard? Paul would get really frustrated that people didn't work hard. He said, Do they, will they work hard? That's the third question. And then the last one is there a sense of concern. And that's this one here where you look at somebody and say, can you love these people? Not, not, not as you want them to be, but as they are. Can you love these people? Do you think it's possible that you could like these people? You're going to spend a lot of time with them. Can you like them? Can you love them? Will you lead them? Has God placed this group of Christians who are called to serve together and work together in your heart as he's placed them in mine? 
Paul would say we because he lived we. He lived we for the sake of the gospel. And it was out of a sense of solidarity that he was called to serve and to proclaim. And together he proclaimed Christ with his other sisters and brothers. He proclaimed Christ. And he fleshed out that message in the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 14, so that, there was, so that there was clarity about what he meant when he said, I proclaim Jesus. He said this, beginning in verse 14, for the love of Christ, what? Compels us. So why did Jesus leave that, that place in the hills with the Lord when the disciples came knocking saying, everybody's looking for you? Well, it wasn't the voice of the crowd because Jesus didn't go back to where the crowd was calling him to. It was the love of the Father. He said, let us go to these other towns for this is my purpose. This is my purpose. He didn't go back to Caesarea. He went to Magdala these other little places and he went there because he was compelled by the love of God for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all then all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer thus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. He preached the gospel. He talked about the one who knew no sin, who became sin, that we might be reconciled to God. You say, Matt, that doesn't sound fair. It's grace. It's mercy. It's the extravagant, costly kindness of God displayed in the midst of human history. It is the cross and the empty tomb, and they boldly proclaim that life can be had in and only in Christ, that we can die to our sin and be raised to walk in the newness of life because of this one named Jesus. That's why we baptize people in water. We plunge them into a watery grave, proclaiming the sufficiency of Christ's death. And we snatch them up, and the first thing they do is breathe in. They draw life into their lungs. That's their very first act. And we proclaim life in this Jesus. He said, we're doing this together. We're doing this together. Friends, Christ has never changed his mind about the importance of serving, being propelled, compelled, pushed, constrained by the love of God to proclaim life in Christ. His church for thousands of years now has been faithfully sharing, proclaiming that message of Christ. So there's two things that we must ask ourselves. One, have we, because of Christ's mercy, been reconciled to God? Have you trusted 
God with your life based on the merits of Christ, not on your own abilities, intellects, or promise to try harder. Have you been brought home to the Lord through the mercy of Jesus? If your answer is no or I don't know, today can be the beginning of a new journey and a new life for you based on the mercy and the love and the amazing grace of God. If your answer is a humble and confident yes, thanks to God, let me ask you a second question. Are you working together with him to fulfill his purpose in this earth? Are you serving? And does your service proclaim the hope that you have within you because of God and his grace? Christ-like service proclaims. Second thing. Christ-like service prevails. He went about proclaiming and casting out demons. I've been to Israel twice, once 20 years ago as a college student, once last summer as the pastor of First Baptist Church, Waco. They were very different experiences. Uh, the first time I had a big red beard and a t-shirt from the Jacob's Ladder Folk Music Festival in Birkenstock Sandals, I got detained in the airports, you know, back in those days. Last year I was the pastor of First Baptist Church, Waco. Things have changed a lot in Israel in, in 20 years, and a lot of things have stayed the same. But one of the things that changed, there's a lot of new sites. And one of the new sites that had been developed uh, very impressively in the past 20 years was the synagogue at Magdala. This would be one of those places where Jesus went from here. You, you might be familiar with Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala who gave her life fully and completely to Jesus because he battled the darkness that was in her heart. She walked with Christ because he set her free. Now, we're uncomfortable thinking about powers and principalities and adversaries. We're uncomfortable thinking about that because for the most part, we've managed to to nudge God out of the big important parts of our lives. If we can do it without God, we certainly can do it without having to worry about the principalities and the powers. This is a modern phenomenon and we're not richer for it, we're not wiser for it, and we're not more alive because of it. In 1951, a Scottish preacher named James Stewart, a great, a great Scottish preacher, was invited to do the Lyman Beecher Lectures at Yale. This is a big deal for preachers. I mean, this is like the NBA March Madness for preachers. You, this is the final four for preachers, and he was invited to do the Lyman Beecher's Lectures in 1951. And he used that occasion to talk about how we stripped our faith from God and the principalities and powers. And he talked about how the cross battled the adversary and won and how our life must reflect that. He mourns on our law saying, we have lost Paul fighting with wild beasts at Ephesus and Luther flinging his ink pot at the devil in place of a, of a ministry that is propelled by the love of God uh, and that battles the principalities and powers, he said, we're left with the things of this earth, equating democracy and the fight against communism as being synonymous with the righteousness of God. He said, this is naive. He said, and it, it, pity, the facile imagination which assumes that our policies are blameless and our own hands are clean. He says, no, the real warfare cuts across all such alignments and lies deeper down in the visible, invisible realm where sinister forces stand flaming and fanatic against the rule of Christ. And the only way to meet that demonic, mystic passion is with the dunamis and passion of the Lord. Was it not Christ's declared intention to kindle that flame in human hearts? 
It was indeed. And if our service is to be a Christ-like service, it has to prevail. It has to prevail against the principalities and the powers. Early in the epistle, in, 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 in the second chapter, verse 11, Paul is talking to them about their life together. and He calls them to a life of forgiveness. He says, I want you to pr practice forgiveness and reconciliation so that the Satan does not take advantage of you. He recognizes that church could be taken advantage of by the adversary. Look, you can affirm the reality of the principalities and powers, or you can deny the reality, but you're still open. You are still open. Affirming or denying, still open to being taken advantage of by the enemies of the Lord, the host of wickedness. For there is indeed a war, and it's a war that rages and burns in our soul. Paul talked about it like this in chapter 10. He says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lonely among, lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you that when I present, I may not be bold, the confidence in when I tend to bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of our God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought in obedience to Christ. Our warfare is not carnal. Deep down in our hearts and in the midst of our community, there is a conflict. The same conflict that was present in that synagogue at Magdala. There is a conflict. And Christ the Lord is victor, and from his victory he would have us walk and serve and humbly prevail against those forces that would deceive our minds. I would suggest very quickly that there are numerous sources to this dark deception. One is the, the whispers of the adversary himself. He says, I don't want you to be taken advantage of by the adversary. The second one, there's sort of a toxic group think. Listen to this in, in chapter 10, verse 12. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You know what that means? Here's, here's the Matt Snowden interpretation of that. If you want to find a group of people that will help you stay in bondage and dumb, you'll find them, and they'll sound really smart. We can parrot lines of deception back and forth to one another until we're absolutely convinced we're the ones who have it figured out and everybody else is messed up. There's nothing new at all about that. And then the last one, deceptive leaders. Chapter 11, listen to verse 3. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness so your minds may be corrupted from the sincerity and the simplicity that is in Christ. Now listen to verse 13 and 14. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles for Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their work. Meaning everybody in Sunday clothes with a silver tongue is not representing the truth of the gospel. And many will be used to deceive God's people from the simplicity and the sincerity that is Christ Jesus, the Lord. We must prevail. So what do we do? I think genuine awareness is the first place to begin. We've just got to understand the reality of life as it's defined by Scripture, not as we see it. And there's more to life than what we can taste and touch and hear and feel. 
We must be aware of what the real gospel is and what its alternatives are. We must preach the gospel to ourselves. We must, like chapter 10, verse 5 says, be captivated by Christ. If you are captivated by Jesus, you will prevail. We must be aware. And we must be discerning. Listen, if your Jesus always agrees with you and claps for you, you probably are worshiping the wrong Jesus. The gospel stands over against us as well as with us and molds and shapes us into the likeness of Christ. We must be aware and we must humble ourselves. Chapter 12, 9 and 10, he talks about the sufficiency of God's grace. We are called by Scripture to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may lift us up. We're called to resist the adversary that he would flee. We're called to submit ourselves unto the Lord. We're called to humble ourselves. So, friends, we have been called to serve, will you? And will your service look like Christ? Will it proclaim hope in him? Will it prevail against the darkness? If the Spirit of Christ is at work in your midst, it will indeed. Let's stand and pray. God, we stand in this place today grateful that you have, you have come among us to give us life. We thank you that because of your great love for us, you sent forth your Son, that if we would believe in him, we would not perish, but we would have everlasting life. Lord, I'm grateful for each person in this room that has trusted and believed in you. And I pray, Lord, for anyone who is here or who is listening or watching that they haven't done that. Lord, that you would speak to their hearts in the most impressive and powerful way and that you would call them to yourself. Lord, we're grateful that you have called us to serve. And as we stand and sing together, Lord, we recommit ourselves to doing that together both locally and around the world. Lord, we love you because you loved us first. And as we respond in song, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us by the power of your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. David?
Ron and Josh have brought these chairs down here for Aaron and Grace Ogburn, whom I'd like to invite to come and, and stand here. Aaron and Grace have been in our church family, part of our family, for a number of years now. We watch them as young college students, green as gourds, uh, trying to figure out the world. We, we saw them fall in love with each other and get married, and we saw them go through seminary. We, we sent you off to pastor church for a little while, and that was fun. And, and uh, all along, uh, they felt God's uh, special call on their life uh, for Bible translation and for cross-cultural ministry. And so uh, Aaron and Grace will be leaving us, uh, but not leaving us soon as she begins her work as a Bible translator and Aaron works among refugees. Uh, we want to send them off with our encouragement and our prayers today. So I invite you, uh, all of you that would, to come and, and lay your hands on Aaron and Grace. Deacons, please come and lead the way. Let's, let's go ahead and now. Anyone else who'd like to come as well, please come. We're going to voice a prayer for these, these friends of ours as we as we encourage them toward what God has called them to next. All right. We got plenty of space. The rest of you there, if you would hold each other's hands, let's just as a symbol of our solidarity together to church, if you just hold hands, maybe. And... All right. Lord God, we love you, and we thank you for, for grace, for Aaron. We thank you for the fact that you have loved them and drawn them to yourself. We thank you that they have an abiding and a winsome faith in you. And Lord, that the overflow of their faith is desire to make you known. Lord, we pray for a supernatural anointing on their life, on their marriage, on their ministry. We pray, Lord, for the power of Christ to rest on them. That they would know of our love and our concern. That they would know of our gladness and joy. We pray, Lord, that you would let them know your presence on those days of great challenge, those days of great excitement, and for all those many mundane days in between. Lord, guard their hearts and give them strength. Lord, you're good. You've been good to us. And for this, we give you thanks. And with one bold, grateful voice, we say together, amen and amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.